second. Okay, I think we have everyone in that uh, coming in for now. Jerry, you want to go ahead and kick it off? Sure. Hello, welcome back. Hello, welcome back to Encore Learning. Uh, I'm Terry Smith, and we have a jam packed uh, presentation this afternoon. Uh, you, uh, for the, you're going to learn why pickleball is America's fastest growing sport and all sorts of things about. Um, the, uh, uh, what's going on in Arlington and also other places. So before we get into all that, um, ready to go, we have to talk about some tech tips about Q&A. Use the Q&A function, not chat. Chat is disabled. Click the, uh, the, uh, the Q&A icon to do chat. Questions are not visible to the audience, um, but similar questions will be consolidated. And you can use a Zoom control to either display or hide a live transcript of captions. And when you leave the webinar, you will see a survey request. It's very brief. Please take it. And now let's look, look, some of the, look at the, some of the upcoming events. Uh, here's a friend from uh, of David Tate's A National Law History is revealed by author Ann Beltran's characters. That's on. July 28th, 4th, uh, from 3 to 4.30. And um, on August 7th, Neil Howe, fourth turning is here. He will be introduced at that time by Libby Garvey. Um, and uh, that should be an interesting presentation also. So without going too much further, I'm going to turn it over to uh, turn it over to um, Louise to introduce the speakers. Thank you, uh, Terry. Hi, everybody. Uh, Louise Kenny here um, and on behalf of the special events group here at uh, Encore Learning. Uh, you know, normally we have presentations about the arts or about tours of facilities or uh, historical figures or theater. But this, this year, this uh, time we're focusing on sports. We don't normally focus on sports, but this was too good a story to not have a presentation. And we have some um, local experts to talk to us about why it is so popular, pickleball, and then to also give some tips, tips about it if you're a pickleball player. Um, our first speaker is George Dwyer. And uh, I know George on two counts, actually. Um, he was our, my instructor here in Alexandria to teach us. He teaches with the rec center here. And actually, I think he has a role in Arlington and now Georgetown as well. Um, George is a, a, was a, a tennis player in his youth. He also was an accomplished platform tennis uh, player. And he was a journalist for 40 years um, working at ABC and then Voice of America. But he found his true calling after he retired and he became a certified pickleball pro and uh, is playing in tournaments. In fact, he just came back from a tournament in Ireland um, and uh, that's the other thing that we have in, in common that we, uh, I was recently in, in Ireland and uh, George gave me some hints on what to do and where, and where to go on it. So we're connected kind of on two counts, but uh, the pickleball is what we want to talk about today. Also locally from here in Alexandria is uh, Steve Nelson. Um, Steve is Mr. Pickleball really in, uh, in Alexandria. He really keeps us all going and keeps us all scheduled and is extremely helpful um, to everybody here in Alexandria. Um, he's, uh, his career was in the IT world. Um, after uh, retiring, he too became engaged with pickleball. He says modestly that he started 10 years ago and he hasn't improved since then, but I have seen him play and uh, he's, not a, he's not a rookie. So, um, uh, but he said maybe he'll get some lessons soon. I don't know, but he's, whatever you're doing, Steve, keep doing it, right? So, um, so this is a really fun presentation to have today. Um, before we get going, we wanted to do a quick poll 
and see who among you plays pickleball or doesn't play pickleball or would like to start to play pickleball. So we're gonna bring up the survey and uh, George will relate the results to it. So again, welcome and on to pickleball. George, I think you're it. The survey, I, I don't, I'm the sorry. The survey should happen in a minute. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry it's not launching. So um, just go ahead, thanks. Okay, uh, well, well, we'll move past the survey. Um, the topic at hand, when first of all, thank you to Encore Learning on behalf of myself and Steve. Uh, why is this the, the nation's fastest growing sport? It's North America's fastest growing sport and is growing rapidly around the world. And uh, the simple answer is it, it's fun and it has a very low barrier to entry. That means you don't have to be an elite athlete. You don't have to be a young person. Uh, you, you, very little required to come in and play. In fact, a lot of times we describe this as a, as a giant game of ping pong. Uh, you know, people from the outside looking in seem to think it's a smaller version of tennis. Tennis is extremely, if anybody's watching Wimbledon this week, uh, I, it calls for, you know, incredible athletic prowess. This does not. Uh, the rules are simple. It's the equipment is r relatively cheap and durable. And it's just caught hold and there, uh, shows no sign of uh, diminishing in appeal. So uh, as you look around the, our area, and Steve is going to talk more about this, but uh, there are facilities are expanding. Uh, great numbers of people are coming into the game. I spend about 35 hours a week giving instruction and uh, it's just nonstop and a lot of repeat customers too. Um, so to give you a sense of it, uh, we have a short video. Every time I teach my first course to new players, uh, we go through the rules, we go through the scorekeeping, which some people find quite challenging. Uh, you know, is really not that difficult after a while. And uh, after I teach, I send everybody a series of three very short videos. I call it my video starter kit. And it recaps what I taught on the court. So uh, we're gonna roll about a minute and a half of that and you'll see what the game looks like. Just take a, uh, a couple of seconds. In this video, we are going to go over the basics of what you need to know to begin playing the game of pickleball. For those of you who have never heard of pickleball, pickleball is a paddle sport that has similarities to tennis, badminton, and table tennis. Players use a wood or composite type paddle, usually 12 to 15 inches long and around 8 inches wide, with a ball similar to that of a wiffle ball. It can be played in doubles or singles and is played on a badminton sized court. Before I begin explaining the basic gameplay and rules of pickleball, it will help to first go over the names of some of the lines and areas of the court. These big squares on the courts are called service courts. There are two right service courts, one on each side, as well as two left service courts, again, one on each side. The center lines are the lines that divide the service courts that are on the same side as one another. The non-volley zone, also known as the kitchen, is the area of the court extending from either side of the net until it reaches a service court. The line that separates the non-volley zone with the service courts is called the non-volley line, or the kitchen line. The sidelines are the long lines that stretch from end to end along the length of the court. And the baselines are the lines that contain the depth of the court. The official definitions and descriptions of these areas and lines are provided by the International Federation of Pickleball, or the IFB, the currently recognized global governing body of pickleball. A link to the official rules and definitions provided by the IFP can be found below in the description. When starting pickleball, there is no official way to decide which side goes first, but a common way to decide is either a coin toss or picking a side that always goes first, like the north or the east side. Okay, I think we can cut the video. Um, 
that is a really well graphically displayed. Um, I just want to quickly mention that most of us who play in Arlington, Alexandria, McLean, don't often get to play on a dedicated pickleball court. I don't know if that's still true for you, Steve, but uh, they're, they're on their way. What we do, we play uh, either in a multi-purpose facility, a gym that has lines down for volleyball and basketball, and uh, it's a, a it's a spaghetti bowl of uh, of lines down there. You really, you know, it's not the optimal experience when you actually play on one of these dedicated courts. You're gonna experience the the feeling that I described before. It's sort of and, you know, I say, uh, honey, I shrunk the kids. I'm standing on a ping pong table, live action uh, playing. It's just incredibly uh, fun. Uh, I repeat myself. And uh, before I go back to uh, Steve, who's, who's going to speak a little bit about the, the local scene, I, most people are interested in the origin story. Where did this thing come from? And just very briefly, uh, it's been around since 1965. The story has it that there were uh, three dads who went out to play golf on Bainbridge Island, which is off of Seattle. And when they came home, they found all the kids laying around not doing anything and asked, so, you know, what's up? And the kids said, well, everything is broken. And they went into the shed. They had a, a blacktop uh, badminton court down and they strung the badminton net at tennis level. And then they took some ping pong paddles and a wiffle ball from wiffle ball and they invented pickleball. And uh, it took, you know, many years to, to really catch hold. But I would say in the last 15, 20 years, it's been going great guns. And especially people give uh, attribute it to the pandemic. But it was a socially dis distanced activity that people could do during lockdown. And so the, the numbers pretty much doubled during the pandemic. And uh, now the last estimate I heard is it's up around 36 million people who ha have played it and a great many who play it on a very regular basis. So uh, Steve Nelson is going to talk a little bit about the scene in Arlington and Alexandria, Steve. Hey, thank you, George. <clears throat> Yeah, more, most specifically, um, I'll talk about uh, the city, the, the resources that the city of Alexandria provides for pickleball players. Um, however, if you want to know more about Arlington and Fairfax County, there is a, a shared document that can be, I don't know, I hadn't thought about providing. If you're familiar with Bitly, the abbreviating service, bit.ly slash Alexandria Courts. It's all one word, but A in Alexandria and C in Courts are capitalized. Capitalization counts in, in these shortcuts. If you go to that document, and I happen to have it right here, uh, it'll give you an overview, that's not very helpful, of how to find out what's going on in Arlington, Fairfax, and the country. Uh, the city of Alexandria started offering indoor court times about as best as I can recall about 10 years ago. And it was at just one rec center, the Charles Houston Rec Center. And it was Thursday and Friday mornings. And when I wanted to play on other days, on more days, I bought a senior pass for Arlington. It wasn't too expensive. And then I could play at their rec centers, which at the time at any rate were Walter Reed. Thomas Jefferson and um, Arlington Mill. And that served the purpose pretty well for several years. And then uh, a second Alexandria Rec Center came on board with some pickleball hours indoors. Again, this is all indoors. Uh, it, that was the Nanny J. Lee Rec Center. So now we had Mondays and Tuesdays covered. And then a couple of years after that, they brought on uh, Patrick Henry, which was a brand new facility, very nice, for Wednesday day and the only indoor evening hours the city provides uh, Wednesday evenings. <clears throat> so now I never had to leave Alexandria to play pickleball. It was all indoors. 
And I was perfectly content doing that. And of course, then the pandemic came and uh, the, uh, the city shut down everything. There were a few outdoor courts, but nobody played outdoors because it was either too hot or too cold, uh, you know, according to us. And, uh, but we were basically forced to play outdoors or nowhere. And the outdoor courts are governed differently than the indoor courts. The indoor courts, the rec center, the staff of the rec center says, these are the days, these are the hours. But outdoor courts, that, that's the only part of the city resources that have a hard and fast rule. And the rule is all courts are open. Uh, courts are open to all um, and uh, first come, first serve. And if others are waiting, limit play. Those are the only rules that we've got in playing outdoors. And that's for the courts. Now for coordinating players, we have a website. There are several to choose from. The one we picked is called playtimescheduler.com. And what that allows us to do is to communicate with other players saying on such and such a day, it's such, such a time, let's get together and, and play at this particular uh, outdoor court. And that worked pretty well. And of course, we learned how to play outdoors, which we had always been reluctant to do before then. Uh, but we did. I remember in December of 2020, the day after Christmas, it was below freezing, but we were playing pickleball down in uh, Del Rey at the Calisano Park. And uh, you just, we just adapted. We learned how to layer up and, and deal with the, with the cold and dealing with the heat actually is more difficult and more potentially dangerous, but we do it. Stay hydrated, stay wet. And uh, so what um, happened with the pandemic, and I know this happened in the District of Columbia too, now that we're playing outdoors, passers-by actually see the game and they wonder what it is. And they are curious and they ask around and they found out about it. And we went through a real growth period, which we're still going through because with the uh, addition of professional leagues, professional league, uh, professional teams, the visibility that they draw, you know, we've seen articles in the Post and uh, New York Times and, and everywhere, it seems like in the last year or so, there's been a, a lot of publicity about the game. So we're going through growing pains, basically. We're getting a, a lot more players. Now, the city has responded by adding a lot more outdoor courts. And they've got, they've added, I'd say about to 10 or so more courts. They are on track to, to add about 10 more. When they will, we'll know it when it's done. They, they can't schedule very well. It's factors out of their control. But um, we keep in touch. We, uh, I, long before the pandemic, I started a, a, a distro list. This is why people tend to think I'm a, some sort of nexus for information. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you send an email to Alex B. Pickle, I didn't want to use my own name, uh, alexbpickle at gmail.com, then we can add you to a distro list. And then if there's anything to announce, we send out a, an email blast from there. And we also have a Google group. We don't use it that much because the playtime scheduler works pretty well in letting players talk as to, to the group. Wow. Uh, so that's how we handle communications. And uh, I, I still, from time to time, get called Alex. And I thought, Alex B. Pickle, that surely no one will think that that's an actual person. but. Uh, Apparently, I was not clever enough. Anyway, so now we have our outdoor courts. Uh, uh, these courts are always cohabitating with tennis nets and tennis courts. And the tennis players, understandably, don't really like to see their, their lines cluttered with pickleball lines. Pickleball players have never had the, the pleasure of pristine courts. We've always had to share lines. You just, you can get used to it. 
Uh, an example is Simpson Park in Delray between uh, Route 1 and Mount Vernon Avenue. It's near the Monroe Y. It's a, a park with two tennis courts on it. And it can uh, handle four pickleball courts. Uh, one pickleball court for, for each side. The, nets, the pickleball nets are uh, on wheels, so they can be rolled on and off because the tennis nets are permanent. And it works pretty well. Uh, we tend to have pickleball during weekdays and sort of relinquish the, other, the tennis courts to evenings and weekends, because that's when tennis players traditionally have been most likely to play in the city, in the city provided resources. So uh, we have had occasion when there's a tennis court being used and there are two pickleball courts being used at the same time. It's not a problem, but two tennis players can displace eight pickleball players. So it's always uh, looking forward to the day when we can have dedicated courts. I don't know when or how that'll happen, but uh, that's sort of the state of the, of, of the city provided resources right now. Yeah. Uh, Steve, then uh, I'll jump in and just um, mention that, you know, the, our region is, uh, uh, I don't know say a hotbed, but uh, it's typical of other localities around the country. I, I survey uh, Google, uh, Google News, I'm, I'm on an alert for pickleball, so every morning I get a, a push on what's happening all across the country, and uh, the Arlington scene is, is fairly typical. Uh, the level of enthusiasm, fairly typical. And uh, there's a little bit of conflict in the air too. Uh, we have another video that we wanna put up. It was done by Fox News 5, uh, I think in 2021. And things haven't changed a great deal. So if we can run that, and uh, we'll talk more about that on the, on the other side of it. Watch your audio levels, this might be a little hot. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. This this was a, a little bit loud in uh, rehearsals, so we'll, we'll see how it plays. It is causing a bit of an uproar in Northern Virginia. You ever play? I have a couple times. Oh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> You're gonna have to teach me. Well, pickleball has become so popular that local leaders are hearing about it a lot. Fox Eyes Josh Rosenthal has the story from Arlington tonight. The courts are packed. The people are passionate. Ah! It's my dream. I'm putting it out there. <laughs> Listen to me. And Helen White is far from alone. We met her in Arlington, but she's also part of a group called Fairfax County Advocates for Pickleball, formed because of a problem. The game has become so popular, there are not enough places to play. And Fairfax County has heard all about it. There's a very dedicated group of pickleball players across the county. Lots and lots and lots of comments and multiple hundreds, if not much more than that. Yeah. Hundreds, if not thousands of comments about pickleball. <laughs> they love pickleball. The campaign is getting results. A 44 page study and also a virtual public meeting scheduled for Tuesday night. Officials even went so far as to tell us more pickleball courts are coming although the specifics still need to be worked out. Devil's in the details. Add it all up and it means more and more people who've never played will soon have the chance, especially if you say this around Helen White. I've never played pickleball. I've taught over 3,000 people how to play pickleball. Is that true? I've been playing for over 10 years and I've been teaching ever since, yeah. We're more polite than tennis. I just punch, 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 and then high five. Oh yeah, Josh. You like this? I like it. There you go. Whoa. Were you ever a tennis player? No. Okay, then I'm going to change, I'm going to help you with your stance. I appreciate so. you asking, though, as <laughs> if that was a possibility. Yeah, yeah now we're talking. I was going to say, did I remind you of Agassi or Sampras or somebody? Is there a pickleball player that I should be putting in there instead? Ben Johns. Do I remind you of Ben Johns yet? Yes, yes. Uh, do, yet? Not quite. Thank you. Uh, touch gently. You're an amazing teacher. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Ellen was amazing. And to give you just one more example of how passionate these pickleball players are, we were at the court earlier, hadn't even started shooting, hadn't even taken the camera out of the car. Somebody heard me talking about pickleball and he walks up, pulls out a stack, a stack <laughs> of these and hands me one. Guys, back to you. 
Okay, well, uh, as I say, that was a couple of years ago. Uh, the number of players has not uh, decreased at all. It's, it's gone up quite a bit. And as I was saying, uh, Arlington is fairly typical of other communities, but now the game is also spreading around the world. Something like 60 national federations, uh, is, the game is being considered for uh, being included in the 2028 Olympics, which are gonna be in Los Angeles as a demonstration event uh, prior to acceptance as a, a full-time sport. It's NCAA um, activity is, it's, I, I work at Georgetown and they have a large inter, intramural program, but uh, team sports and NCAA sanctioned pickleball is on its way as well. Um, it's in the elementary schools, it's in the high schools and junior high schools. And, um, you know, the international development is just particularly encouraging. It's an American sport. It was uh, invented here, growing rapidly, catching on. And as we've seen uh, with the examples of other U.S. sports, of uh, uh, basketball, volleyball, baseball, uh, sports are really uh, a, a powerful technology, if you want to say, for bringing people together, uh, you know, having people understand uh, how to play by rules, how to get along. Uh, so I'm uh, just very encouraged, and I think everybody should be very encouraged by uh, the idea of the growth of this game. I wanted to say a little bit, too, about the, the health benefits. Uh, those are measurable. It's what's called a, a full body weight exercise. So you're on your feet, you're out there for might be uh, 20 minutes or might be an hour and a half. And I, it's good for your balance. It's good for bone density. It's good for cardiovascular. Uh, it has psychological benefits and it has social benefits. On the flip side of that, there were reports last week that it's costing the U.S. economy, uh, I don't know how they measure this, but by one report was 300 million, another report said 400, and a third said $500 million in uh, costs from injuries. So injuries are not unknown, but they're in every other activity as well. Uh, I think that over the weekend, CNN ran a report it featured the chief uh, executive officer of USA Pickleball, which is the governing association. And he, he was saying more people get hurt on exercise equipment. Uh, he mentioned another sport. I don't even pay attention to other sports anymore. But um, it's, yeah, uh, you know, you're balancing uh, health benefits versus risk of injury. The risk of injury is fairly slight. The great uh, preponderance of injuries come from people falling down. So at the same time you're working on your bone density and, and your balance, you have to be extremely careful not to fall. And usually if you get good instruction uh, and you listen to it and heed it, uh, you're, you're fairly unlikely to fall. Um, for players who are senior players like I am, uh, 50 plus, 60 plus and more, uh, you know, it's really just, uh, I think it's a healthful activity to take the measure of yourself and say, look, um, you know, if I fall down, I'm going to break and I'm not going to get better for a while. So I want to be out here playing. I'm going to stay within my limits. I'm not going to be, uh, pretend I'm 12 or 15 or 19. Uh, that that's good advice. I can give everyone this, this afternoon. Um, the the um, going back to just the 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 growth in our area, <clears throat> uh, as Steve was saying, we don't we don't know. You know as city councils have voted for funding in D.C., in Alexandria, in Arlington. Uh, they're also being challenged uh, by people who are not crazy about the game because of the noise that it makes, and. Uh, uh, it took a while for me to understand that the ball has a different characteristic than a tennis ball. It doesn't make a, a sound that's, uh, let's say, as euphonic or uh, pleasant sounding. It takes some getting used to. Uh, 
But the other factor that I didn't realize at, at first was pe people are much more social when they play this game. They're closer together uh, and they talk and they chat and they hoop and they holler a bit. And uh, there's a little bit of local conflict about that and also a huge project to try and see what can be done to keep the noise levels down with windscreens or maybe a redesign of the ball or paddle technology. Uh, sounds maybe frivolous, but the, the sound really drives some people up the wall. Uh, I drive past once in a while a, a um, assisted living place out in McLean and they put in pickleball courts you have some people who benefit greatly from that and love to play. And you have other people who are a little further along in their, um, uh, they're, they're older folks who, who don't participate anymore and they maybe would rather take a nap in the afternoon. And so they, they're not crazy about hearing the noise. Uh, I just think it's important to mention because the part of the ti original title of this is what's all the fuss about and uh, most of it is about how much fun this is and uh, how wildly popular it's gotten. I think in the, in the general culture, if you watch uh, very much TV, you're gonna see lots and lots of commercials featuring pickleball players these days, uh, including Mr. T is in one of them. Uh, and I, I mean, it's just a cultural indicator that there's a hook there, there, that there are people who are very avid about this thing and will continue to be. So we have a, a, another video. We want to talk a little bit more, uh, Steve and I both, about the technical aspects of play. And so, Ken, you have a, a video of players playing. Yes. Good. Okay. So once again, uh, what you're going to see is... Uh, a pretty good example of how the game is played. Now, if you notice, I don't know, can I be heard? Yes. Yeah. If you notice, everybody has gotten up close to the net they're at the uh, boundary of that blue part of the court and the, and the red part of the court. And among the accomplished players, 80 to 90% of the game is played up in that short area up next to the net, which we call the kitchen, which the rule book calls the non-volley zone. And the rule, as maybe you saw earlier, is you cannot hit a ball a volley, which is when you hit it before it bounces when you're in standing inside that red area and so this really defies the way the game is played they're hitting these little dinky shots yeah. except for that one uh but that's a very good example of the way the game works is that people uh, start the game off from the far end of the court they serve the other team returns the ball and before you know it all four players if it's doubles and typically it is are playing uh, close to the net. And it has everything to do with the, with the bounce properties of the ball. It doesn't bounce very high. So if you hit it softly in front of someone, you're going to force them to have to hit up on the ball to get it over the net. And the smartest thing they can do is to also hit softly so it drops in front of you, in front of your feet. Eventually someone gets stressed, or impatient and they hit the ball with a little bit too much impetus and you see it up high above the net. And when you see that ball, that's the one that you now can hit down on and you can hit it with some a surprising amount of pace and win the point. So it looks like a, a ticky tacky kind of uh, uh, activity. Uh, but those players are, they're playing cat and mouse. They're waiting for the other side to make a mistake, elevate the ball, and then it gets fun. It gets, uh, it's, it's fun already, but it gets, that's where uh, points are won. So uh, I'm gonna give it back to Steve and let him describe his playing experience and evolution as, as a player. Well, of course, the one thing that 
newcomers always uh, face is scoring. <clears throat> uh, there, as uh, George said, you usually play doubles, especially in a, in a rec center situation because you want to let everybody play as much as possible. And uh, so it's the, the scoring, I'll just touch briefly on it. it, it this, the person serving has to call out the score. And the score is always three numbers. And the first number is how many points the serving side has. The second side number is how many points the opponent has, the opposite side. And the third number is which serve is it? Is it the first server or the second server? Because one, uh, without getting into the weeds, the, 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 the first server serves until there's a fault, and then it goes to the second server until there's a fault, and then the serve switches to the other side, side out, they call it. <clears throat> and I've been playing for 10 years, and I still forget what the score is when I'm playing, and I have to ask everybody, my first or second server, I don't remember. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, the, the beginners have to learn what it is and learn to announce it. And the old the older players have to remember what it is. And that's always a, a, an ongoing situation to deal with as, as you play. The other thing is the kitchen. Um, the, the way I like to think of it is that the kitchen on the opponent's side is my territory. And the kitchen on my side is the opponent's territory. If I can hit in the other guy's kitchen, I can help defeat or deflate their chances of hitting a, a, an offensive shot back, as George explained. And uh, so that's sort of the way I think of it. And, and when George said cat and mouse, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of people watch pickleball for the first time, and they'll see this, this dinking back and forth, and they'll say, what kind of a game is that? And they don't understand what is going on uh, behind the scenes or in strategically going on. Uh, so uh, you've got to learn when to be up at the kitchen uh, kitchen line and when to when to move back. Uh, and uh, if you can hit a, a, an overhead lob accurately, that's a great skill to have. And, and if you can run back, uh, if you can run, one thing they, they always say is don't run backwards when you're going for a lob. Turn around and run forward and then turn around again because it's a hazard. <coughs> one of the big uh, injuries, probably one of the more common injuries is people stumbling and they're falling and they know they're falling and they stick out their hands to block their fall and they end up injuring or even breaking their wrists. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that's handy to do is know how to fall without hurting yourself. Another thing that I'm big on is uh, eye protection. People don't really wear eye protection. And, uh, well, I just think they should. Uh, I know that if I got, I have cut one kind of, kind of injured eye. And if I took a pickleball to it, I would, probably would, would lose sight in that eye. So I'm very aware of it. And, and I, I try to uh, spread the news on that and reiterate it all the time. Some people listen, some people don't. Though, as far as injuries, uh, those are the ones I come to my mind. And, and the shoes that you have, you got to have pay, pay attention to the shoes. They've got to be the right court shoes, and they've got to be in good condition. My favorite shoes, the soles are are wearing out. They're getting flat. And when I'm playing indoors on a smooth surface like a bas basketball surface as opposed to outside, which is more gritty and more sandpaper alike, uh, I noticed that these shoes can be slippery. And I've either got to resole them or buy other shoes. Yeah, so that's an, an ongoing concern. Um, I don't know, anything else, George, that uh, I should touch on as far as playing the game? The, I'll um, go under the bounce bounce rule. Let's yeah. get into it. Uh, well, again, you know, we should mention, uh, again, in, in terms of avoiding injury, uh, mild stretching, warming up. What uh, um, Warming up is quite simple. I have a stationary bike, and I'm on that for about 10 or 15 minutes before I, I leave the house. I don't know if I stay that warm. But, it, you know, if you can walk around, walk some steps. Uh, occasionally, I'll ask people to walk the walk the lines, walk the boundary lines, just to 
do a reality check on, on how their balance is that day. Um, I used to work at the Department of Veterans Affairs I was, as a television reporter of all things and uh, covered a number of stories about, uh, the VA has a Center for Balance Research, uh, more than one, and um, I, it becomes a critical life skill and uh, a pickleball is actually something will, that will help you improve your balance. Again, with the flip side, that you may have to stay on your feet. Uh, as Steve said, the best way to do that is is to, you know be cautious in your in your movements, especially uh, when the ball goes over your head. Uh, never backpedal. Uh, you can lose spatial awareness if there are no clouds up there. You can get your feet. Uh, uh, you know, uh, jumbled together, and then you're in a free fall, and um, that, that's probably not going to end well. So, uh, you know, you learn to turn laterally to the ball and move back, or turn tail on it and run back, or you learn how to say nice shot and go on to the next one, you know, because it's just not, it's just not worth it uh, being hurt. Uh, you know, we're, we're out there to play, and, and we want to enjoy it. Um, I want to go back to, um, you know, the the growth of the game um, and the possibilities for this game are, uh, I was telling some of the panel here that I recently listened to an audio book on ping pong diplomacy, which happened about 50 years ago. And I see a great potential for pickleball diplomacy as a way of, uh, you know, sharing uh, our culture and, and something that came out of our culture with the peoples in other countries. And uh, it has, I think I mentioned before, just tremendous convening power, uh, tonic power to help people, you know, uh, put aside differences and kind of enjoy and uh, learn to compete cooperatively. It's, a, it's something like a, a, a flight simulator for conflict. You know, you're, you're, you're facing people on the other side of the net and uh, you don't want the best for them in terms of results and they don't want the best for you in terms of results, but it's managed conflict. And so you're working some muscles and some uh, psychic property that, uh, you know, is pretty valuable. And I, I believe uh, very much in that. So on that theme of uh, international play, we have a very short clip from what's called the Bainbridge Cup. The game was invented on Bainbridge Island off Seattle. Uh, the Bainbridge Cup is analogous in a sense to the Davis Cup in tennis. It's the premier international competition. It's only happened a few times, uh, I think four, and three of those were in Europe. But last year, uh, in November 2022, it was held in Mumbai, India. So uh, Ken, do we have that, that clip? Needs to play with good energy out here. Good attacking ball, it's sitting up. Tadpole's attacking, again. Good defense. Nice soft hands, look how that point has now. Oh, and there's a speed up. Rashali serving it, 5-1-2. Nice depth on the serve, good chip return. Good soft hands, they're all in, it's sitting up. Leander puts that one away. 5-6, first server. Attacking third, all players coming in, luck off the net cord, everyone relax, everyone chill. Who's going to attack? There she comes. Oh! Okay, so the, um, that was the, the Bainbridge Cup last year, uh, audio quality, video quality, quality of the commentation, Kate, commentating was uh, not the, the best. But for anybody who's interested, if you go on, uh, well, first of all, I may have mentioned CBS Sports, ESPN, uh, some of the major carriers are uh, have signed contracts, long-term contracts to provide pickleball coverage of significant tournaments. Uh, the US Open, which is played in Florida in April, and the Nationals, which are gonna be played this year in Texas in November. Those are, you can find clips of those on YouTube. They're very exciting. 
Uh, I think the clip of the Bainbridge Cup, as prestigious as it is, is not very uh, exciting looking, but uh, players are now playing in front, front of very large audiences in the thousands in arenas. Uh, they are uh, they're playing for real money. Uh, the top player in the world is actually a guy from our area. His name is Ben Johns, from our area meaning the DMV. He's from Laytonsville, uh, Maryland. And uh, he signed last year a million dollar contract with a paddle company as an endorsement deal. And the money is starting to spread around. The, the, I mean, it's becoming professionalized is what's happening. So I know most people here are interested in it as a participatory uh, type of event, but as a spectator sport, and if you really want to watch people who are terrific, uh, they're going to be coming through town, a big tournament out in College Park in the fall. Uh, if you go a little farther afield in Annapolis and uh, well, uh, the Jefferson Center here in, uh, in Arlington hosted a, a regional uh, tournament which was discontinued uh, once the pandemic rolled into town, but it was players from all and up and down the East coast. And uh, it was very exciting. And if something like that comes back our way, it'll be bigger and better than before. It's a really a fun experience to go out and see the top players play. Uh, it's just giddy. I guess I would say it's just uh, so much fun. Um, and so you know, I, I would encourage you, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, go on the YouTube, uh, type in U.S. Open Pickleball or Pickleball Nationals or Top Points or anything like that. If you really want to see high quality play and uh, it's kind of exciting. And it's again, you know, the the uh, distance between the, the top players and the, and the guy on the recreation court, it's uh, well, it's significant. Uh, but uh, but we we can play. We can have uh, long, long, enjoyable, competitive points. And um, the idea of losing yourself in play is something that's just very psychologically healthy and um, and rare. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, you know, when there is a, an overflow of players, so there are always players kind of sitting on the sidelines waiting to get into a game. And uh, in case anybody hadn't noticed in the last few years, there's been a, a lot of uncivil discourse. People tend, and, and, you know, when they gather around a pickleball pavilion of any kind, they tend to behave better. They tend to prioritize the, the game and the fun they're having and they're anxious to get on the court and, and play themselves. But wonderful conversations take place at a time where I mean, things have really gotten pretty fractious sometimes. And I, you know, I, I can just tell you from personal experience, people that I might have a hard time having an extended conversation with, I can have a great time with sitting next to you waiting to play pickleball. So I, uh, on that theme, I want to give it back to uh, Steve again for, uh, any comments you have about the, the general uh, benefits and, and um, you know, how that plays into the growth of this, of this uh, uh, activity. Yeah. The, the social aspects of the game are terrific because you generally play doubles and you generally play on, and, and the court is smaller. So you do just talk to, to one of the, one of the first teachers I ever had in pickleball taught me the basics of talking trash and uh, saying things like, is that all you got? Or, uh, you know, things that are, are said and accepted in, in lightly and, and without uh, rancor. And uh, so you get to you get to meet people. We try from time to time to actually have social occasion outside of playing, but it's kind of hard to organize. And, uh, Maybe we'll get, get better at it. I don't know. But we get pretty social as it is. We've taught, uh, as uh, George says, in waiting for games. One thing George said that it really bears repeating, and I uh, wish I'd thought of it at first, and that is warm-ups. Warm-ups warm are very important. And pickleball does help you with 
flexibility and balance and uh, you know bone density and everything, but you can amplify it and, and uh, accelerate it by doing balancing and stretching and uh, some limited um, weight bearing exercises outside of pickleball. You don't have to do a lot and there are no magic exercises to do. Just about anything that you do is helpful, but try to cover stretching, strength, and balance. Um, uh, also, as George mentioned, if it looks like that, you're going to have to scramble dangerously to get to mm -hmm. that ball that's just a little out of reach, just let it go mm -hmm. and, uh, and tell, the, tell the other guy that, well, you got that. You got me on that one. Yeah. yeah and because so it I, is, please, Steve. Because uh, uh, it's just recreational play. As I tell my partners when they miss a shot like that, don't worry, the rent money is not on the line. So just let it go. I, I was going to uh, say, I, you know, in terms of the community aspect, there are uh, facilities in other parts of the country. We don't, I don't, we haven't seen one here. Or actually, I think there is one downtown in, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, I won't say the name of it, but it's an interesting concept. It was a uh, it, it was a facility that hosted axe throwing, and they decided to add pickleball and put a forty foot long bar in. That's an interesting combination. Uh, what could possibly go wrong there? But there, uh, you know, there are uh, restaurant chains opening. Uh, there are big box stores that are closing and being replaced with pickleball slash, uh, uh, you know, restaurant operations. And um, I, it's, you know, it's, uh, the entrepreneurs, are, they've picked up on the social aspect of it uh, as much as anything else. And uh, hard to say where it's going to go from here in that sense. I, I just want to finish up with a quick word about uh, competition and play. We, uh, I coach, and uh, occasionally I'll hear a player say, "Oh, you know, I don't care, or I don't care what the score is." Or, um, you you want to have fun, but I there is a certain ethic of uh, offering your best game to the other side. Again, as Steve said, without injuring yourself. You know, it, it's sort of like if four people got together to play bridge, and one of them wasn't paying any attention and uh, didn't really care how it went. That just diminishes the experience for other people. So you're, as I said before, you're trying to lose yourself in the game in a sense. Uh, you're almost uh, assuming a different persona. You're the player and you are have a partner. Uh, rule number one for uh, you know, having a partner means it's a team sport and you're Number one priority is to support your partner. That's part of the social aspect too. You know, if they're not playing well, you're you're trying you're not giving advice. Too late for that, but you're trying to give encouragement. And um, on the the other side of that is trying not to uh, let your frustration show too much when when uh, you know when things aren't going well for them. Uh, but it's very healthy in that sense. It makes you a better person, I think. To uh, to work on your patience, to work on your, um, you know, your in encouraging muscles and uh, to treat the other team with, uh, when we talk about trash, trash talk, that's very light. That doesn't get too heavy in most cases. Uh, you know, there's a theory that respect the, respect your team, your teammate, respect the other players and respect the game. So, I did want to make that point about respecting the game, you know, uh, take it a little bit seriously when you play it, not dead seriously. It's, it's play, but um, you know, um, the, no tragedy. If somebody forgets to score, it happens all the time. We help each other. Uh, the rules call for you to announce the score every time someone serves. So more or less you can keep it on track. And when you can't, it becomes collaborative and the four players, you know, figure out where where they're at in the game, and you know, uh, it's it's more fun if you all. It's a sign of respect, in fact, to offer your best game on that day to the other side when you're playing. Makes it more fun for everybody. So uh, that's the end of the sermon. 
And uh, I think it's time for Q and A. Is uh, Luis? Is that your turn to open that up? It is my turn to open that up. So thank you. I did want to uh, mention to people that you generally play with people at your level. So yeah. that takes the pressure away as well. And there's a rating system that you look at. So these are all 2.5 players or these are all 5.0 5, uh, 5 players. So that, that takes the pressure of you that you're playing with people at your level or a little above, but it's, uh, it, it's helpful like that. Um, well, uh, thank you both for a terrific presentation. I hope that you, uh, you uh, gave some pointers to the people playing and I hope you entice people to, that aren't playing to get in the game already. Um, uh, a couple of things I, I play, I'm, I'm at a, I'm at a junior level to these guys, but um, I did want to mention the tournaments. Uh, I went to one last year in Maryland at College Park, Maryland, and we stayed for three hours watching these players. They were just great. And the intimacy of these, I mean, maybe it will grow to 6,000 people watching it, but right when we saw it, the players, you could put your hand out and put your hand on the back and say, great play. That's how personal and how intimate it is. So I would really encourage uh, if there is another tournament in, in College Park, Maryland this year um, to definitely go. It was very, very worthwhile. Um, we have a few questions here. So I wanted to, uh, to add, uh, and come, uh, there are questions and comments. The first is from Ingrid Moroy. She says, not a question, just a comment about the $400 million that we picklers are supposedly cost to the healthcare system. It costs the same system, 179 billion a year caused by obesity, while cardiovascular disease is cost to the healthcare system, $407 billion a year. I'd rather get injured as a result of pickleball than obesity or heart disease. And then she comments, nice presentation so far. Thanks for this. So Ingrid, you, you, you have disciples over here supporting that. Do you want to comment on it either, George or, or Steve? Um, well, I agree. You know, I, um, if you uh, sit on the couch and I um, mean, bad things are going to happen too. That's the, I think they call it in the sitting is the new smoking. It's, uh, you know, it's very good to get out. We mentioned the psychological benefits and the social aspect of this. You just feel good. You feel like you've done something worthwhile in your day. And I think here's so many players who say, I need, you know, I need to get my game in today. Uh, it's big, uh, Steve, I'm sure you hear that too. You know, people just want to make it a part of their day, get it in because it's a lift. And uh, you see other people, you know, again, I think partly inflected by the pandemic. Uh, it, people got out of their houses. It was this famous um, phenomenon they called the cul-de-sac courts where people would get a portable net and put it out in the cul-de-sac and the neighbors would come out and play. Uh, I, you know, we're very fortunate that this activity came along at this time. Um, so yeah, um, you know, doing nothing is, uh, is no good. Doing extreme sports is, I wouldn't do them. You know, I'm not a skateboarder or a bungee jumper, but uh, this is extremely pleasurable. It's, it's not, extremely difficult to play. And, um, I, you know, I, I, if Go I for it. do it every day, well, I do it every day. So. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Karen uh, Menicelli comments, please emphasize how encouraging players, players are for each other. Yeah. And I would say that uh, I, that's my experience as well. You both. Yeah, absolutely. All the time, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, that's one of the nice things about recreational play, playing in a rec center, because it's very informal. You, you want to play well. My, the worst person I play against is myself with unforced errors. Someday I do pretty well. Some days I don't do very well. But it is very collegial. And as I always say and think, the most important thing I do there is sweat. Mm -hmm. It is a good exercise. Every time my doctor says, well, what do you do for exercise? And I say, I play pickleball. And he says, that's it. Uh, I got it. That's enough. That's yeah. good. good. I, um, you know, in terms of the support and collegiality, there's a, um, um, no, it's not a habit. I'm not sure what the word is. But after every game ends, all four players come up to the, to the net and they tap paddles 
and they congratulate e each other, whether sincerely or not. Uh, and uh, throughout the game, this was interesting because I was a tennis player. I played doubles. I don't ever remember touching rackets with my partner, but that's a, a pretty frequent thing in, in, um, in pickleball. Uh, you tap paddles to just say, hey, great job, partner, or, or support your partner, or tough luck. And uh, I told myself I wasn't going to do that uh, because I hadn't done it before, and I do it all the time now. It's just somehow uh, this game brings that out of you, you know, come on, let's go. And uh, it's it's really fun. You get outside yourself. You're not just, you know, thinking about yourself. You're, if your partner's having a hard time, you, you get to, you know, extend a hand up. Uh, just one last thing about what Steve was saying, you know, the, the you're trying to get your best game out of yourself on any given day. And someday the best part of your game doesn't show up. It's just not there. And so part of the activity is working the problem. Sometimes it feels like Apollo 13 and nothing's working and you just keep, you know, shuffling the deck and, and playing for time and seeing, you know, things will get better. And you know what, if, if they don't, it's no great tragedy. You know, there's another game right around the corner. Uh, another, another question was, could you briefly go over the scoring again in terms of what, what, what is the final score? Yeah, many... I, I, um, people uh, tend to find, because you call uh, three numbers, you know, you, we, if we're serving, we call our score, and then we announce how many points you have. The game is played to 11 points, which is pretty, pretty brief. And uh, you have to win by two. So if it's 11-10, uh, you have to get that 12th point. And games can go, you know, uh, they can go on for a while, theoretically, into high numbers. But usually with somebody wins 11, whatever, uh, only the team, this is a, a little um, abstract, but only the team that's serving can actually put a point up on the scoreboard, let's say. Uh, if they don't win a point, the other team doesn't get, doesn't get a point. They sort of get credit to winning the ball back so that now they're going to serve and they can score points and you can't. Mm -hmm. so somebody has described this as uh, is how volleyball used to keep score. If that helps okay. anybody, yeah, uh, yeah, but it's hard to it's hard to call an audible and and uh, describe scorekeeping. Uh, those videos that we showed before, there are three of those. Uh, if you type in pure pickleball, you'll find all three of those on YouTube, and uh, they're really pretty good at explaining the basic rules, which are simple. The scorekeeping, not quite so simple, and. Uh, you know, a few other definitions about the boundaries and, and the equipment. And uh, how, so how are close calls called? Ah, uh, I, well, I can take that or you can, Steve. I'll take it. You took the last yeah. one. <clears throat> They're called very carefully. Yeah. The, uh, the governing body in the United States is uh, called USA Pickleball. And they are the keepers of the rules, at least for in the United States. And uh, that uh, calling uh, a close shot is has been discussed and changed slightly in the last few years. Technically, uh, if the ball hits the line, any part of the ball hits the line, it's in. And uh, if the uh, if the line happens to be the kitchen line, then the ball's in the kitchen. That's normally when it hits the line, that's good. But if it's the kitchen line, it may not be good. And uh, because you, you had to hit beyond it. But uh, now, they're, now they're saying uh, because of the, you, you, can be, you can be three feet away, you can be 25 feet away, you can be looking at the, the ball on the other court from oblique angles, and you can't tell whether, you know, it's just a dime-sized part of the ball that actually makes contact with the floor because the floor, the kitchen, the whole court is only two dimensions. So it's, you know, it's either contact or it's not, there's no space above it. And basically what they're saying is just be tolerant, be, don't, you know, try your best. 
Yeah. And and uh, it, when it's really close, and it are at there, there are times when it is very close and very hard to say. Best thing to do is just be uh, a gentle person about it and and yield the call. When in doubt, don't don't argue about it. It's it it, it for as concise as the line is, calling line calls is fuzzy, and yeah. that's when sportsmanship uh, and attitude come in. I was just going to, I'm oh, sorry, Luis, you want to? I said, my experience is that, that people are very gracious. I mean, it's that everybody's not hinging their life on that call. You know, they say, you're closer to it. Okay, we'll go with your call. You know, that, it, that kind of attitude. And it, yeah, it, uh, the, no question that, um, you know, you, you really want to be tolerant. The, because as Steve mentioned, you're calling the point of contact with the ball in the court. And that point of contact, it's not like a tennis ball that compresses. You're calling a, a, a spot on the court that's about the size of a dime or a penny. And if you don't have a, a, a perspective on it, you know, if I'm seeing it from the far side of the ball and looking back, it can look 100% a, a in and it might be out. Right. Uh, I'm obliged to play it as if it's in. And if my partner... Who's, you know, hopefully my partner is who's on the other side of the ball can see some small separation between ball and line. And that's the only way, you know, if okay. you can't see that you have to consider that ball in and you have to give it, you know, the, um, I mean, that's, that's goes that's to the other side. Okay. Uh, Patricia says, would you elaborate please? And I'm not Patricia, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking to elaborate on. If you'd like to, Chime in, you know, unmute yourself and ask the question. Please feel free. I think she wants to know about um, equipment. Um, is some better than others? Oh, okay. Um, okay. Anybody yeah, want to come uh, on equipment? Steve, would you? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the first pickleball paddle I ever bought cost me $40. Now you can spend $250. It's evolved a lot. Uh, the original pickleballs were just uh, paddles cut out of plywood and you can still get wooden paddles. That might be fine for very rudimentary beginning, but uh, you wanna get past it very quickly. Uh, the, uh, the paddles now are, are composite, carbon fiber. Some are rimless, some have rims. Uh, the, the, um, the rule for official tournament allowable paddles has a length to width ratio and instead of limits. So you can have a narrow paddle that's long or you can have a short paddle that's wide. Variations, of course, uh, the weight varies a lot differently too. Uh, generally, they're about seven and a half ounces, but they can go plus or minus uh, an ounce, ounce and a half. And you can add, you can customize it all you want too. And so the, it, it's a problem because you can't go to a store and try out a dozen different paddles and find out what you like. The uh, online stores that sell the, that have the biggest variety of paddles will let you try before you buy. You can order several paddles and you have up to 30 days to try them and, and then return the ones that you don't want. It's kind of a hassle to do that and it's time consuming, especially if you want to you want to make that decision right now, but uh, it's uh, it, it's until we get a, a a really dedicated store for pickleball, and we try they tried to have one in Alexandria here a few few years ago, but it didn't catch on. It's the best thing to do is talk to your fellow players, see what they've got, ask them if you can heft it, or maybe even hit a couple balls with it. Just try things out. It's trial and error. There's no magic formula. You have to Steve, try it before you Steve, buy. Steve, can you very quickly uh, touch on shoes? Better shoes? What kind of shoes? Average shoes? Tennis shoes? Um, well, what they're generally, what, I, what I've always called them is generally are, are court shoes as opposed to running shoes. Running shoes tend to have that flared out heel in the back. And that's great for running, but it can trip you up in, on a court. And so, yeah, anything that's considered a court shoe or any sort of a paddle sport shoe, just uh, make sure that it's a, it fits comfortably. 
Does that help any? That's the answer. Yeah, I just, can I, a quick word about equipment too. Um, sometimes if you're starting off, I, I mean, they're really, uh, uh, as Steve said, primitive uh, um, plywood paddles that are, you don't want that for very long. So I, I usually, I recommend if people do is they, they buy a bundle, they get two paddles, price point is 40, 50, $60. Now you can play with somebody else anytime, uh, you know, you have one for a, a friend and, um, you, you know, if you go on Amazon or any place and just put in a uh, pickleball paddle bundle, you'll find those, they're pretty good deals. Uh, th uh, this is not a spiel for Amazon, but tomorrow's prime day. So they're going to be very good deals on paddles tomorrow. Um, it, it's, uh, they're durable too. You know, you're going to have it for a few years, most likely. And uh, I tell people, too, you know, if you get a paddle that you're comfortable with you know, and you have the um, ability to consider the, the design, too. Do, do, you, do you like how it looks? Do you love your paddle? It actually makes a difference, you know, if you're playing with a piece of equipment that you really think reflects who you are and what your game is. It sounds maybe weird, but I believe that. Louise, so this, is, this is Ken. I wanted to direct you in the Q&A. Go to the answer tab. I've answered some of the questions, but we can, you can address those and see that there's been several questions. Oh, oh okay. I, I was yeah. following open months. Oh. Um, uh, Eileen Janice uh, asked, I see big crowds of people waiting for their play to their turn to play. How do you decide who plays and how long until your next turn? Oh boy. That's yours, Steve. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's, that's interesting. It's an interesting question. Uh, the, it's, it's different from the indoor courts to the outdoor courts in Alexandria in the indoor courts, we tend to have a clipboard with a sign up sheet per game and uh, so when you uh, finish a game you walk over to the clipboard and you sign up for the, the next available court or uh, next available game. I found out from talking to visitors from around the country that we're about the only place in the world that uses a clipboard and a sign up sheet. Mm. And of course we don't do that outdoors. Uh, you just, uh, and, and most, places i actually haven't done this but i think most places around the world you line your paddles up for the next game and it, it makes a lot of sense and we probably should do it here in alexandria but it means change and of course nobody likes change so we haven't so what we what we tend to do in the outdoor courts is we just sort of cluster together we you you, you don't want to if you have four courts like we do at simpson park uh, that's 16 players. So you want to have something like 20 or 22 players there so that you have a chance to rest between games because you, you can't just go from game to game. You get worn out. It is that, that demanding. And uh, it's, because it's a community, you kind of all know each other. You, you kind of group together. And it, it's just sort of by feel, really. Uh, that's not the best way to do it. And I don't think that's the way it happens most of the time around the country and probably the world. That's how it happens in Alexandria. I would comment on that. It's it's not a big deal. You you'll get to play. You know, I mean, people are nice. Uh, it's organized. If, if you don't understand the system, somebody will explain the system when you get there. So it's it's really very friendly and easygoing. Um, I have a question. So if somebody's listening to this and says, "Man, I like this. I want to get on with this trend," what should they do in Arlington and Alexandria and and the, the the Northern Virginia area. What, what's the next step? Sign up for George's classes. <laughs> Sign up for classes. But I, have, but I know from experience, they, they uh, fill up very quickly. Yes, so, they do. Yeah. So sign up for, are there other classes available um, in addition to George's? When we say George's, we mean the Alexandria Rec, Rec Center, right? Yeah. Yes. How, about, how about Arlington? It's, I, I work in Arlington for for a firm uh, that has a contract to use the public courts, including Walter Reed and some of the courts in Falls Church. 
And uh, so they, I can't just walk out on a court. They, they would call me a pirate is actually a technical term for that, to just show up and start uh, uh, giving lessons and using the, the city or, or county court space to profit from it. Uh, so the best way of all is to get in touch with one of these companies, if I'm allowed to mention it, um, somebody give me a heads up and I'll say it. Otherwise, um, maybe yes. you can put it. What's a company? Come on. Is it, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the company is called First Serve. First Serve. That's one yeah. way to and so uh, Helen White, who was the, you know, kind of the premier figure in pickleball in this area, uh, she's head of pickleball operations for First Serve. She's a, been involved with all of this longer than any of us. She's considered the premier coach in, a, in our area. Uh, great teacher and uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, she at one point was going to try and be on this call uh, today. I think she's in Pittsburgh playing in the national senior games. So um, that's first serve. Uh, YMCA, at least in Arlington, uh, has clinics and learn to play events and drop in play. That's pretty good. Um, and, and where else, you know, I think 2024 is gonna be the big year for expanded facilities. Uh, I mean, the word is that Walter Reed is supposed to become much, uh, I, I believe, a, um, a pickleball specific installation, uh, which makes a, a big difference, I think I said before. And you're going to see more of that. I, I think the places that are using multi-purpose situations, meaning pickleball courts on top of tennis courts or on top of basketball courts, I don't, I don't think they're going to be able to compete as new players come in and offer uh, upgraded facilities because there's, there's just a kind of uh, ecstatic feeling when you play on an actual court with proper boundaries and without the, all the visual clutter of, of other lines. Um, so, you know, I, I guess it's not it's extremely helpful, but I would say keep your eye out because it's, these well, facilities. I'm pretty are sure that Encore Learning isn't going to promote anybody's individual courts. I mean, yeah. We are a regional nationwide organization. Yeah. And so, you know, to promote Arlington or Alexandria or McLean, that's not happening. No, but, uh, right. We're going we're gonna to move on, Chris. So thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could just add one thing mm -hmm. uh, very quickly. Uh, another uh, path is to go to this playtimescheduler.com site that we use because uh, it's free to join. You can see what uh, sessions are being planned and also you can say what level you are at. So if you're a, a two out of five, if you're a beginner, a two level, uh, uh, you can say, you can tell people and like-minded, like-leveled people can, can play together. So you, you can find, maybe not lessons, but at least you can find uh, a place to play with, uh, with similar, where, where you can sort of teach yourselves. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And there's the, uh, the cul-de-sac concept, right? Uh, yeah. We mentioned before cul-de-sac play. Uh, you know, if you have a, um, a neighborhood where you can put a net up and can play in a driveway or, uh, you know, in a cul-de-sac or some other place, it's the, uh, very much in the character of pickleball that it's like, you know, we're going to make this work. That's where the origins of the sport. And that's, still remains a part of the ethic of this is we're going to, you know, take what we have and we're going to go out there and we're going to have fun. We're going to figure out a way to, to do this. Got it. Uh, I just want to comment. Uh, uh, 55 plus currently has lessons in, uh, in Arlington. Uh, Barbara Rosenfeld, uh, a friend of mine here in Alexandria says, are there different quality balls that you should buy? Are there ones that are better than others? You don't even have to say a brand, but are there things to look yeah. for? Outdoor balls are different than indoor balls, correct? Yes. I, well, I'll address that because I just had a uh, situation where this came up. Uh, outdoor balls have 40 small holes in them. Uh, that makes them more resistant than indoor balls, which have 26 slightly larger holes, maybe about the size of a nickel, or maybe not that large. Um, and so there appears to be a bias that players 
uh, as they improve, like to play with the outdoor balls, whether they're playing indoors or outdoors. They make a louder noise. Presumably, they, they go a little bit faster. The bounce characteristic is not exactly the same. And I mentioned this because I played in a tournament. And you, when you play in a tournament, you have to play with the ball that the tournament uh, specifies. Everybody plays with the same ball. So if you're a player and you, you don't like to play with an indoor ball, you know, it would be in your interest to get used to or, or learn to like playing with an indoor ball because you're going to be forced to if you really want to compete in some of these situations. Uh, you know, it's, you can see people get very fussy that I don't like that color or, you know, that brand. Uh, lots of different brands. Some of them are... Uh, I, you know, uh, considered higher quality. And are, if you look in the magazines, you'll see that these are the brands that are accepted most often for tournament play. Um, but um, yeah, you know, the, the, I'll make one last comment about the ball. I can't for the life of me understand why they're ex as expensive as they are. They're a little bit pricey for a piece of plastic. I mean, Steve, do you have any comment on that? It's called making money. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. It's uh, the you know the paddles are more expensive, the balls are more expensive, um, the your prize money is getting larger. It's just it's just the growth of the sport, and uh, you're right. Some balls are uh, don't last very long, and some balls do, and you just have to sort of figure out what you like. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, it's, well it's Terry here. Um, I've got a question. Uh, what is the difference between a $40 paddle and a $250 paddle? I mean, is it a technical difference or is there? It's a technical difference. So, Steve, you want to take, take that? Uh, it's going to be the more expensive paddles can be much lighter. You can adjust the, bal the, the balance point between the handle and the paddle. Uh, Again, the more expensive paddles may not have an edge to them, particularly. So it's flat clear out to the end. Um, my game is not so precise as it makes much difference, but some people don't want any edge. They want it flat out, out to the edge. And of course, composition, um, how long they last and the surface of the paddle. People get kind of fussy about that. I'm a little fussy about that too. I don't want a very smooth surface. I want something with a little bit of texture to it it helps me impart spin uh, onto the ball. And, and yeah, I would think so. Spin is a great weapon to have. I was thinking about grooves in the, in the paddle. I, don't, I, I guess the paddles do not have grooves or in them uh, to help with spin. Yeah, so so much, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just simply, it's not so much grooves as it's just sort of a sandpaper texture. Oh, okay. The uh, I, I just to make a comment on this the the um, when you play in a tournament the referee comes out and they will run their hand over the surface of your paddle. The originally I, I believe that uh, you know having a great deal of texture on the paddle was highly discouraged, and my understanding is the paddle manufacturers are kind of pushing. Uh, the limits of that, and you know, the players want it. The uh, paddle manufacturers are happy to supply it, and uh, the association, which originally, you know, uh, discouraged uh, having a highly textured surface on your paddle, is seems to be giving way a little bit, uh, getting pushed around. It seems to me, but uh, you know, they still. Uh, have specifications from, from USA Pickleball. You have to meet those to get a certified paddle. And we, you know, when you go in a tournament, a, a ref is going to check your paddle. So it's it's uh, marginally more uh, textured up than it used to be. But uh, you know, it's it's not like tennis at all. It's not like a set of strings on a on a tennis racket. There's you would call it purchase. The, the paddle does not have a whole lot of purchase on the ball. Uh, so if that helps. Uh, we're getting a little bit, uh, to, well, not a little bit, we're getting very close to our end time here. Do each of you have a final thought to share with our current and potential pickleball players? 
Well, I'll just let me go first and then George can have the, the last word. Uh, one thing about pickleball, there's a saying about that's applied to a lot of things. It's easy to learn and hard to master. And that's certainly true of pickleball. You can, uh, it's easy to learn. It's easy to start enjoying it right away and go to YouTube and look at tournament play and you can see how far you can go if you want to, uh, but it's, but you can enjoy it right out of the gate. Thank you, Steve. George, final, yeah. final word. Uh, yes, I wanted to thank uh, Ken Norris, who's a former colleague of mine in voice of, at uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. Was uh, he helped in optimizing these videos and in running these videos? I'm very grateful to him. Uh, There's probably not time for him to come on now, but we're, just before the call, we had a discussion. Uh, there's an aspect of pickleball at the higher level that people uh, are not always aware of, and it's called misdirection. So Ken is a professional magician. And when you're good enough to be able to put the ball where you want to, then you, you start working on disguising that. And that becomes incredibly enjoyable. I mean, we said cat and mouse before. And, you know, if you telegraph your shots, you're, they, they're gonna be less effective than they were before. So it's a, a hard thing to teach. Uh, at a beginner level because you're telling people to violate principles uh, that are pretty sound. But once you've got very good control, uh, uh, it becomes a, a game that involves a lot of thinking, uh, you know, and uh, partner cooperation. And, uh, it, you know, so I would never be put off by uh, the, the, the athletic challenge of this game is daunting. It's, it just simply is not. And the satisfactions that come from it, they're just as much social and emotional. Uh, and I, the way you would play a game of chess or, or uh, poker, uh, you know, you, you get that kind of psychic feedback and it's just extremely enjoyable uh, over and above the physical activity. Right. You know, when you said the misdirect, I was thinking about what a quarterback does, right? He looks one way and throws the other way. That's right. right. Yeah. Same, same uh, theory. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much um, for your knowledge, for your enthusiasm, for your honesty about the whole game. Uh, it's a great game. And also I wanted to let everybody know that uh, the best players in the world are, the woman is 15 or 16 years old, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's not not just a game for, for seniors at all. It's, it's really a game for everybody. So, uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you to everybody that stayed in right till 4.30. Uh, um, lots of good things happening in the last half hour with the Q and A. So uh, I think we're sending you a survey to, uh, to evaluate this presentation, to give us some feedback. Um, see you on the courts in Alexandria or Arlington. You'll, you'll recognize uh, Steve and George and uh, join everybody, join us all on the courts, okay? <laughs>